Hey everyone, in this video we're going to talk about journal bearings and specifically introducing types of lubrication and bearing friction theory. This is the first video of module 4 of our mechanical design course and this video is part of a lecture series on mechanical design too. So we're going to get started um, in this video talking about general journal bearings and lubrication and first before we introduce actual journal bearings we're going to talk about types of lubrication and a refresher on viscosity which could be learned from uh, any fluid mechanics class. So to get started, we're going to just uh, look at what an actual journal bearing is and what a journal bearing is, and we'll go into more depth after once we look at a uh, actual diagram, is if you have a outer ring and a shaft together, instead of connecting them with a rolling contact bearing, which was described in module three, we can actually connect these two uh, things, so a journal in the middle, so we call the middle part a journal, and then the outer part um, is just the ring that goes around it or the annulus around it. Uh, we can separate these two materials with some uh, lubricant or some oil generally. And what we can say about this is that it is helpful to us, instead of having two metal pieces rotating uh, against each other, uh, one way to look at those pieces is that we're going to lower our friction between two materials. So if we have two materials that are rotating against each other, obviously having oil in there is going to lower the friction. It's also going to lower the friction compared to a, a rolling contact bearing. Uh, not by much, but it can it, it can help. There's also going to be lower heating. So whenever we think about our bearings, if we didn't have any uh, any sort of um, lubricant in the middle, we, we would have uh, two surfaces that would be heating a lot against each other because they would be sliding against each other. And finally, what we do is we extend life by wear reduction. So we, we reduce wear. And Proper design of journal bearings is very important because it allows us to improve on those three things. Improve on not having much heating, improve on lowering the friction as much as we can, as well as uh, extending the life through wear reduction that we hopefully can do. Okay, so before we get started with looking at bearings specifically, we want to kind of just look at different types of lubrication that happen, and then uh, the different types that we could use potentially in journal bearings, but just in general. And after that, we're gonna look at viscosity. And finally, uh, following that, we're gonna introduce bearing friction theory based on um, some studies uh, done by someone called Petrov. So let's start with types of lubrication first. So let's look at the different types of lubrication. And Shigley's Mechanical Design uh, book has some more information on these types of lubrication in more depth uh, and is a good resource to have if you want to read more about the types of lubrication. But here we're just going to summarize all of them and kind of discuss like how they work in a very simplistic manner just so that we know uh, what it could be used for if we need to use it. So the number one type of lubrication, the first type of lubrication is called hydrodynamic and as the name suggests hydro means uh, liquid and dynamic means movement so uh, typically in a hydrodynamic lubricant sy system we have a load carrying and I'm going to write all of this down so that we have it in our notes uh, it is a little bit tedious to write everything down and it slows down the lecture but I think it's important to have this written down and if you can follow along and take the notes it, it, it'll help in mem in rem remembering at least so we have load carrying surfaces so the inner surface and the outer surface usually in a form of a cylinder are separated by a thick film of lubricant and we'll talk about what thick film means in the context sorry thick film of lubricant. And we'll talk about what this uh, thick film means, so I'm just going to underline it now 
And this is actually a definition of how a lubricant uh, should be when you have hydrodynamic lubrication. If you have the opposite of thick film, which is thin film lubrication, what happens is you typically have a problem with uh, excessive wear and you don't have enough uh, lubricant between the two surfaces. Okay, so we always require a thick film of lubricant and that will be um, a term that we will see later what thick film actually means. Okay, so bear with me for now. So this requires an adequate supply of lubricant at all times. So what we mean by this is that um, lubricant is not just completely static in a system of uh, journal bearing. It usually, uh, the lubrication usually occurs and it usually moves around within the bearing all the time and is kind of cycled through the bearing uh, to give it pressure. And that requires an adequate supply of lubricant and, and a certain flow rate of lubricant from the lubricant to to a certain to a cycle that we'll talk about a little bit later as well. Okay, and one thing that's important with thick film is that if we looked at our system, so let's say we had, and I'm going to over exaggerate the space with a lubricant. Okay, so we had a journal in the middle with some a ring, and then the lubricant would be in red. Okay, um, the problem is that you could have, for example, the effect of gravity would push this down. And if you don't have a thick film lubricant, what could happen is this, the bottom surface here, I'll highlight it in yellow, the bottom surface could touch with the bottom surface of the outer. So that could be a problem. So the thick film allows us to not have that happen. And now if this is rotating, if the journal is rotating, then it'll automatically usually self-center within a thick film of lubricant. Okay, but we'll talk about that later as we go, uh, once we start looking in f future videos as to how this works. Okay, so let's talk about other um, other type of uh, lubrications. So we have, instead of hydrodynamic, we also have hydrostatic. So hydrostatic is essentially, you just use high pressure to separate components. So in this case, it's not dynamic. We just use the pressure that we can input from each side and use some sort of liquid to separate the components by adding some pressure from all sides if you want to or from some sides and it, it basically creates this separation and this lubrication that is for a static system so that you don't have any problems but it's used a lot less in journal bearings but it's still one another one is called solid film And what solid film lubrication is when you actually deposit a solid film on a material that is very, very um, resistant to um, to wear and to friction. Okay, so um, there are some solid film lubrications that are used in, for example, internal combustion engines and other systems. And what dry lubrication is good for is it's good for extreme high temperatures. So whenever you have extremely high temperatures, a solid film is actually very helpful because it doesn't really uh, change in consistency and becomes, for example, from thick to thin film. So whenever the temperature goes up, usually uh, a liquid becomes more and um, more liquid, essentially, it, it doesn't behave as much as a solid, so it, it becomes a problem. Um, so having this dry lubrication is very helpful for extremely high temperatures. Although not as good as hydrodynamic, it does help in high temperature situations where hydrodynamic doesn't really work because the fluid that we're using doesn't withstand those pressure. It would become a gas probably at that temperature. Um, another term which we won't go much into detail on is elastohydrodynamic. So as the name indicates, it's a hydrodynamic, but with... Um, elastic uh, elastic liquids or non-Newtonian fluids. So they're fluids that behave in a slightly different way than a typical Newtonian fluid, but it's not really used that much in bearings. And 
kind of outside the scope of this of this lecture series but yeah um the last one is called boundary lubrication and what boundary lubrication is uh is is to chemically get rid of surface imperfections And this is usually done at the molecular level. So it's not trying to like smooth it out with like sandpaper or anything like that. It's at the molecular level, you're trying to get rid of surface imperfection either by depositing some material on top and making it uh, smooth at the top by creating some sort of, of film, kind of like solid film, but a little bit different because it's a little bit more, uh, you're working with the boundary itself as opposed to putting something over the boundary that films the whole uh, the whole boundary. So slightly different, but very similar in application, I guess. So now that we've done this, and now that we've written down some of the lubrications, what we're going to mostly focus on is hydrodynamic uh, for uh, this specific uh, module. But going into this module, we also need to remind ourselves of what viscosity means, and what it actually stands for and how it's calculated really quickly. So we're going to do a quick crash course in viscosity just to make sure that we know what it means. So viscosity, uh, if you want to, you can pause the video now and just kind of try to remember what viscosity means. But viscosity is the is written as mu usually, okay, Greek letter mu, and it's the measure of internal frictional resistance of a fluid. And what this really means is that it is essentially looking at how well a fluid resists to its own motion. So for example, water has a very low viscosity. If I, let's say I have a cup of water and I decide to slosh it around, it's going to move very, very easily. There's not a lot of internal frictional resistance in the fluid. Now, if I, were, if I had a cup of honey and I were to slosh it from left to right, I wouldn't have much movement. Okay, so if I put force on honey and I try to move it sideways, honey is going to have a high viscosity because it's going to have a high internal resistance. Now, a cup of water or water in itself, if I try to move the top surface, it's going to be very easy to move. So it has a low internal frictional resistance. So that's what it means practically. Now, to come up with the equations for this, what we can do is we can do an experiment where we would have let's say a fluid against a fixed wall at the bottom and then at the top of the fluid we're going to have a block that gets pushed with an area a and it gets pushed at a certain velocity with a force uh, associated with it and we'll call the velocity capital u and then what we see is if we have this block and we'll highlight this block and we'll just shade it in just so that it's separate if we have this block, then we can see that the fluid usually, whenever it starts, so before it moves, the block is fixed. So you have a fixed line between the bottom point and the top point. What happens is once this block starts moving, what you usually see happen is a velocity of your fluid following this block to be a velocity profile that looks something like this. Okay, and we can call this the y-axis, so we'll call this the y-axis, we'll say that this has a height h, okay, so the column of fluid that we're looking at has a height h, and um, this would be, our, our local velocity would be a function of y, so our velocity would increase as y increases, essentially, okay, and then what we can do is we can start coming up with a system of equations. Now, if you want to review this in more depth, just look up viscosity definition, or you can go to a fluid mechanics book and look at uh, definition of viscosity and derivation of viscosity. We're not going to do a full derivation here, um, but just know there's a lot of videos and a lot of content uh, uh, online that's available for you to look at this. Okay, and hopefully you already know this from a fluid mechanics course that you would have taken uh, before a mechanical design course, which we're in right now. So looking at this, um, we can write that du dy, or the rate of change of velocity uh, with distance, essentially how 
velocity increases as y goes up. So essentially what we're writing is how does velocity increase as you go up in y is we, we're going to define this as the rate of change. of velocity with distance. And this is also called, in other terms, a velocity gradient. So essentially, it is a gradient of velocity because the velocity increases as you go up in y. And so if we were to write the shear stress uh, on the fluid, we could say that the shear stress would be equal to tau is equal to F over A. So force over the area of the fluid that's being moved. And that can be translated as mu times du dy. Okay, so it's, it's the measure of the internal resistance multiplied by the velocity gradient. That would give us what F over A actually is in our diagram. So we can translate that to a new term, which is a constant, it's called mu, times du dy. It would give us the same thing, okay? And we can go further in, a, in our analysis and say that du dy on our diagram is actually equal, if we look at the full du dy, if we have a linear relation for u, it means that du dy is actually equal to u, capital U, over h. Okay, it's the same as the capital U over h, because h is the total y, and u is the total velocity at the top. So we can rewrite tau as mu, or the shear stress, is equal to mu u over h. Remember that tau is shear stress. Okay, perfect. And we're going to use this to understand what mu is, but the only reason we're doing this derivation is to try and understand what it means and how we can use it later on, okay? So it's not like we're going to need to know in depth why the derivation is this way, okay? And so the term mu, or also called absolute viscosity, also called dynamic viscosity in some cases, is equal to, is in units of pascals times seconds, or our units of pound force times second per square inch. Okay, and this can also be written as a, a term called rain. Okay, so there is a unit for pound force second divided by square inches, and that unit is also called a rain, named after Reynolds, uh, Osborne Reynolds, uh, uh, um, an engineer that did a lot of experiments and a scientist that did a lot of experiments. So it's based on him, and that's the, the unit of rain. And we'll use the unit of rain uh, throughout our analysis of Raymond de Boyd charts, which we'll look at uh, in our formula sheet. For module four, uh, you'll have the rain unit or micro rain unit, which would be that unit times 10 to the minus six. But we'll talk all, all about that in, um, in the next videos as well. So the next thing I want to talk about now that we've kind of looked at what viscosity means and what it actually means in terms of, um, in terms of what's happening, we can now find what, what it's good about viscosity is that we can find a relation between the shear stress and the velocity at which the fluid is moved and the height away from the wall, okay? So that's really what this equation gives us. It gives us that the shear stress is related to a constant times the velocity of the fluid uh, over the height at where the velocity is happening. And so this mu is always a constant, so you can do this experiment, and you can do this experiment, experiment for all different fluids, and then you can find your mu value and you can apply it to bearing friction theory because the friction inside the fluid comes mostly from this mu term, okay? All right, so let's look at bearing friction theory and start developing some equations for bearing friction. Now, there's two different ways in which we're gonna use uh, bearing friction in this module. And 
what we're going to do is we're going to first uh, visit uh, an equation called Petrov's equation. So Petrov actually developed these equations based on his knowledge of bearings and his analysis of a system of bearings and found terms for friction inside a bearing uh, completely uh, from a theoretical point of view. And then from Petrov's equations, we then developed some charts that were developed through theory, but as well through experiments. And they are usually more uh, used than Petrov's equation. But Petrov's equation is kind of the start of it all and how we kind of get to a theoretical approach to the problem. And once we had a clear uh, system of how to approach uh, the system theoretically, we started doing experiments and we started uh, creating some charts that we were using uh, to solve our problems. Kind of like in the AGMA method in module two, where we looked at um, gear design uh, through an experimental lens. In here, we're gonna look at journal bearings through first a theoretical lens, but then an experimental lens, uh, which is gonna be the preferred method usually. But you can still use Petrov's equation sometimes for a few things. Okay, but we're gonna start with this derivation of Petrov's equation to start with. And then uh, in future videos, we'll look at the Ramon de Boyd charts, um, which are the charts that we're gonna be using mostly throughout these the our problems in this, in this um, module. So Petrov's equation. So we're gonna write Petrov's equation and we're gonna develop Petrov's equations first. Okay, and one of the assumption that we're going to make in order to develop these equation is that the shaft is concentric with a bushing. I mean, I'm gonna copy over a diagram. I'm gonna rewrite bushing as well because I don't know what happened here, but. So I'm gonna copy over a diagram so we can understand what the bushing is, what the journal is and how it works. But essentially the bushing is the outer part of the bearing and the journal is the middle part or the shaft inside the bearing. Okay, and the assumption is that the shaft is concentric with a bushing. So that means that it's perfectly centered within a bushing and we don't have any deviation from the centering, which we'll see later on uh, once we start looking at charts that that's actually not the case. It actually moves uh, a little bit uh, out of the center of the ring, but that's an assumption that we can make theoretically uh, to start uh, solving the problem. So I'm going to copy over a chart uh, from our notes here. So give me a second while I copy this over which is at the top here. So we're going to copy this over and bring it, bring it over to the bottom of our notes and we'll get started. Okay. So we have this diagram and as we can see in the diagram, we have a bushing on the outside. We also have a uh, diagram of the bushing uh, that's shown right here. So this is the bushing. And then we have that there is a journal or the shaft in the middle. And then we have some oil right here in all this area, all around our, our bearing. And then we have, we have a seal on the side. So we actually have some fluid here and we have some seal on the side here so that the fluid doesn't leak out. But there's always a little bit of leakage. So we'll talk about side flow and leakage. And then we have an oil fill hole and we have oil coming into our system. And we also have oil coming out of our system some, somewhere. Uh, it either comes out from another hole or it could come out through the sides, uh, but in a controlled manner, okay? And so we have this diagram and we're gonna start uh, developing a system of equations for this diagram. So we can see that we have terms like C, R, so we'll talk about all those, and then W, um, but we're going to write down all the different things that we see in this equation, in this diagram, and then we're going to define all the terms, and then we're going to develop some equations. So first things first, we're going to write that we have C is equal to clearance. Okay, so C is the clearance uh, for the oil, essentially. It's a clearance between the bushing and the journal. Okay, R is the radius 
and L is going to be the length of our bearing. Okay, you can see the length on the right side here on your diagram, it's right here. Okay, and all these are going to usually be measured in inches if we're using uh, US units, in millimeters or meters if you're using uh, SI units, but we'll stick to US units for now, and if we need to convert, we can convert later. Then other things we have are, I'm gonna bring your attention to the left side here. So we have this term N right here. We have a term U, okay? And we have a term A here that we see here and we see here, which is a projected area of our system. So we'll talk about what a projected area means, but we're gonna write that down. So first things first, we have N is equal to RPS, okay? So that's revolutions per second. Okay, so the N value is in RPS, it's in revolutions per second. U is um, a velocity in terms of N. So it's gonna be two pi R N. If you think of our gear systems, it's kind of like a um, tangential velocity essentially. Okay, so it's the tangential velocity that is happening um, in, our, um, in our bearing system. And then A is called the projected area. And this projected area is going to be equal to two pi R times L. So it's essentially the area that is projected for our piston. So it's, it's pretty much as if you were to like unroll uh, your journal that would be the area that would actually be hap that would actually be um, projecting the lubrication essentially. Okay, so um, two pi r is your circumference, and then it's multiplied by the L value, um, so that it essentially encompasses all of the area where your system is in contact with the oil, as if it were unrolled. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. And now what we can do is we can define, we can write that um, the performance of the performance, and we'll write a few more terms after, but for now we have a good amount of terms. So we can write that the performance of our system is going to be based on the viscosity of our fluid. Okay, part of the, part of the performance of our system, and we can, we can bring in a viscosity analysis to our system itself. So we can write that... Um, tau, which is a shear stress, is going to be equal to mu times u over h, okay, based on viscosity analysis. And we can now plug in for u and for h, okay? So what Petrov did is he said, well, we have a journal and a, bear and a bushing, so now let's try and figure out how we can apply a journal rotating within a bushing and see how we can analyze our system based on that. So he said, well, the, if we look at a side view, we have the journal and the bushing, we know that this is rotating. So this is rotating really fast. So it's as if we had a patch, if we look at a patch of, of uh, fluid, so let me zoom into that patch of fluid, we would have a fixed, fixed wall here and a moving wall here. And so we would have a velocity profile that looks like this. And essentially what we would have is a, a measure of how viscosity would happen in that system. So we're looking at viscosity and the, the shear stress analysis of an actual system. And now, depending on the shear stress, we're going to have good performance or bad performance in terms of lubrication of the two systems. So we can't have too thick of a fluid, but we also can't have too thin of a fluid so that there are could create some problems. So we'll talk about the conditions later on. But so tau is equal to mu u over h. So u in this case, we define u as 2 pi r n. So we're going to have 2 pi r. And I'm going to write it in the order that the book does, but it does 2 pi r then mu n. Okay, but it's just mu 2 pi r n and just rearrange a little bit. And then we're going to divide by uh, the height. So the height of our system uh, we know is actually the clearance, okay, so this would be the clearance C, okay, so we're going to divide by C.
So now that we have that, we can now try and figure out how do we relate our shear stress to our force and area in our system. Okay, so we have a projected area where the where the system is actually being, uh, where force is being applied on our system. And we have this W value, which is our force that's being applied to our uh, bearing, uh, to our journal and bushing. Okay, so we have this force W, I'll erase some stuff so that we can see the two W's. We can highlight them. Okay, we have these two W's that are the ones that are being uh, applying the force. And so from our analysis of viscosity, we can say that force is equal to tau times area or tau is equal to um, force over area. We can also write that torque is equal to force times distance. And in this case, the distance where the torque would happen from the center would be F times R, okay, F times radius. So we can come up with an equation for the torque of our system, okay? And the torque of our system, what it's gonna be, is gonna be torque is equal to tau A times R, okay? Tau A being the force. And we can write an equation in terms of that. So we can just write the equation for tau, which we have up here. So tau we have up here. And then we're going to multiply that by the area, which is going to be our projected area. It's the area where the friction is actually happening, multiplied by the radius. So we can find a term for torque. And we'll see why we're looking at torque, because then we're going to write, we're going to rewrite the left side of torque as well from a different approach. Okay. So from a viscosity approach, we have tau AR, and then we can plug in our values. So let me just write the values out. So we have two pi. R mu n over C, that would be our tau term times two pi R L, which is our area term all multiplied by R. And then if we simplify and we rearrange everything together, we get that torque is equal to four times pi squared times R cubed times L times mu times n all divided by C. Okay. So now moving forward, we then say, well, we didn't write the force out. We said force is equal to tau times area. That's the force from the fluid side or from the, um, from the side of what the actual fluid is feeling. Now let's look at, a, let's look at the forces acting outside the liquid. So what we were looking at right now is the effect of the forces onto the liquid. Now we're gonna look at what the forces outside of the liquid are. So what we've been defining is the torque that is created by the viscosity of the liquid and the geometry that we have. And now the forces acting on the liquid can make it, can be used for um, the left side of the equation or to find torque essentially from the outside. So we need to equate, we need to make the torque on the left side and the torque from the outside equal to the one that is required from the geometry that we have essentially. So if we define a small force on the bearing, so let's say if we define a small force on bearing, we have, we're going to call this force W and we're going to make it into pound force. Okay. We already have it in our diagram. We have W in our diagram and we can rewrite this force in terms of pressure. So we can say pressure is equal to, we know that pressure is equal to force over area. So we're deriving a term for pressure. So we can say that pressure is equal to W over to R L. Okay, so that would be the force over area. And um, we would have two R L because our force is acting on um, a system that is just diameter times length, essentially. Okay. And so then we could write that W 
is equal to 2 RL times P. Okay, and then we can go further with this analysis and we can say, well, the frictional force that is created is going to be equal to F times, and it's going to be F times W. So not all the force is going to create friction. Some of the force is going to hold the bearing together, but some of the force is going to create friction. And that is how we can solve for that force, which is the frictional force is going to be equal to the coefficient of friction times the total force on our system, acting on our system. Then we have that T is equal to F times R. So torque is equal to F times R. So from the outside of our system and from the friction point of view, we have that torque is equal to friction times W times R. And that's equal to friction times 2 RL P times R. So then if we go further with this, uh, we can then say that torque is also equal to 2 R squared F L P. So from a frictional, uh, frictional force analysis, uh, from a frictional force analysis approach, we have the following equation. And I invite you to, if you want to look at this into more detail, there's more detail in, in Chigley's mechanical design textbook on this derivation. Uh, we're not going to use this derivation much in this module. That's why we're just writing down the derivation and sort of summarizing that derivation so that then we can use the equation to solve problems, but we're not really going to need to use the derivation more uh, beyond this point. Okay, so now what we can do though is we can equate both sides of the equation. So we can take this equation as one and we can take the other equation as the second one and we can just make them equal to each other. So we're just going to make them equal to each other and then find a term for friction. Okay, and that term for friction is going to be called Petroff's equation. So what Petroff's equations allows you to do is to find the friction based on the different dimensions and the different parameters that we're using on our system. Okay, and that friction term or that coefficient of friction is basically telling us, do we have a good system or a bad system of lubricating? The lower the coefficient of friction, the better, uh, but sometimes you need friction for certain applications. So if we, if we equate those two equations, we have that 4 pi squared r cubed times L times mu times N divided by C is equal to 2 r squared F times L times P. Okay. And if we start canceling equations out, we have this cancels with this. And then we have the cubed term cancels with r squared so r squared gets cancelled and the cubed term so we're left with just r on the left side and then if we rearrange this equation to solve for f we end up with a term that says that f is equal to 2 pi squared times mu n over p times r over c times r over c and this is called Petroff's equation. So this is the derivation that Petroff did in order to, to figure out how we would find the friction for a bearing system based on the geometry of the bearing system and based on the forces on the geometry system. Now, uh, we're just going to write some, some units really quick. So mu we know is equal to Pascal's times second, or mu is equal to rain. We also have, sometimes it'll be written as mu prime, which is in micro rain. Okay, so we'll look at, we'll see a lot of micro rain because of the unit change. Okay, but this is just written as mu rain usually. Okay, so micro, mu stands for micro, so we just use mu rain. Um, for our measurement, but it just means 10 to the minus 6. Okay, so this just means times 10 to the minus 6, okay, for rain. And then P is equal to the pressure 
from forces on the surface. And C is called the radial clearance. And we'll have to be careful in calculating C, but we'll look at that a little bit later. So if I rewrite the equation really quick, I can say that F is equal to two pi squared, which are my constants, okay? Two pi squared is constant, times mu N over P times R over C. And there's a reason why I'm putting these terms separately. So if you look at mu N over C, mu N over P, sorry, mu is a function of the liquid, N is a rotational number and P is a pressure. Now, if you do mu N over P, you actually get what is called a dimensionless term. And dimensionless terms are great because they don't have to be, they don't have to be, um, they can be sized to whatever size you want. So mu n over p is, can always be a constant for any design. Uh, as long as mu n over p is constant, you can apply it to any design of any size. Okay, and this is a dimensionless term. Now, if we look at r over c, r over c is also a dimensionless term. So r over c just becomes dimensionless. So whatever our r over c is, we can scale it up or down. So that means we can apply this equation to any design. And there's a reason why we split them in this way is because we have two dimensionless terms. And that means that if we have dimensionless terms, we can create charts that will relate all of the terms together. And we'll look at that in the next uh, video in this module, but it, it makes it very interesting for us to analyze our systems because the, the systems are dimensionless. Now, another thing that we wanna do is we kind of wanna look at what these terms actually mean and what, what that actually means for friction, okay? We now know that based on this equation, and this is a theoretical equation that will then be applied to in charts in a little bit better way, but we can now say that based on this equation, that friction is dependent or is related to n mu and p and geometry so friction is going to be a function of geometry of the radius and the clearance ratio so depending on how much clearance you have compared to the radius it's going to change your friction so we know that the geometry is important and we need to come up with the right geometry and the friction is also a function of pressure and rotational velocity and viscosity. So we can clearly see that, and this is really important, this is probably the most important part of this video, is if you have a mu increasing, for example, so let's say you kept everything the same, but you increased viscosity, or you changed your fluid to higher viscosity, then your friction would increase. If you kept everything the same, but you increased rotational velocity, your friction would also increase. Now, interestingly, if you increase your pressure on your system, you actually reduce your friction, okay? So the equation tells us what is happening onto friction based on the equation, based on what's, hap what's happening. And it's very important to be able to recognize that if you're ever doing a theoretical problem, you can refer back to this equation, to the Petrov equation and say, well, I know that I need to get a higher friction or I need to get a lower friction in my system. So one way to do that is to change my fluid to a lower viscosity fluid and I know I'm gonna get a lower friction. Okay, so it, it's very helpful in figuring out what's happening. Now, the problem is you can't go to a too low of a viscosity because then you get a problem with what we call unstable lubrication due to thin film. So we need to keep, keep thick film lubrication, which is an assumption that we had made uh, previously. But we'll talk about that in the next video in the module. So we'll see you in the next video. Thank you.